We read the Gospel of Luke in the fourth chapter. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and he returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. It is written, man does not live on bread alone. So the devil led him up to a high place, showed him in an instant all of the kingdoms of the world. He said, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. It is, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then Satan led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said, if you are truly the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guide you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you do, will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, do not put the Lord your God to the test. The word from the Lord in the house of the Lord. I mentioned with the kids about the tithe being an obligation. It was due to, to God. The first 10% of everything you raised, got, grew, whatever, was given to God because he owned you, owned you heart and soul, owned your spirit. And the law said that you'll give him that first 10%. But like I said, they, they were not dummies. They gave everything, but then they had a feast, so they got some back. I, they could have been Methodists, right? <laughs> so the, the tithe was an, was an obligation. It was an onus. It was not a gift. The gift to God came over and above the 10%. The gift to God came over and above the first fruits of your labors. We've... we've yeah, I'm going to say it. We've bastardized the term tithe so much in the church, trying to figure out how to convince you that there's a certain number that is the perfect amount for you to give. And there isn't. The gift to God is a gift to God. And you give the gift freely of your heart. But what is more important is that he wants you to give freely the gift of your heart. Not 10%, all of it. That's where he comes from. And in the gospel it reads that Jesus was tempted for 40 days in the desert. And what does 40, the number 40 mean in the Bible? A number long enough for it to have happened, but not necessarily exactly 40. Yeah, but if it wasn't exactly 40 days, we'd screw up our calendar for Lent. So let's just assume it probably wasn't 40 days, but it happened long enough for Jesus to get hungry and maybe even to be just a little bit delusional out in the desert. Hunger, thirst can drive you that way. And he was offered, first of all, food. And if you haven't eaten in a long time, food looks awfully good to you. But it would be no trick for Jesus to turn a stone into a loaf of bread. He could do that with his hand tied behind him. Look what he did with water at the wedding. Turned it into a lifetime of grace and wine. I, even I can turn stuff in a cardboard box into food. <laughs> Me in a microwave. So that's, that's not where the, where the big rub comes. The next one is he said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and all the money in the world. And if you've been following the news lately, you know what kind of trouble all the money in the world can get you into. You know, people faking news. The, the head of Amazon going to have a $50 billion divorce. Now, that would scare me. <laughs> I mean, just being in the position to have all of that kind of 
financial and physical re resources has to be frightening, has to be scary every day of your life. Look what you can lose. If you have nothing, you got nothing to lose, right? But if the only thing you have is the love of God, you have nothing to lose because you can't lose the love of God. It's an eternal gift. It's an always gift. It's yours forever. You can't trade it for anything. Now, I always wanted to be rich. And I've come to realize in the last few years that there's not very many people in this world who are richer than I am. I have family. I have friends. I have a congregation. I have a God who loves me. What more could I ever ask? I don't care how much money I have. I don't care how much he had he, that he wouldn't give me. I am richer than anyone else I know. Ah, see, I can say that because I'm really proud to be as modest as I am. <laughs> it isn't the things that we have that make us rich. Oh, the money we have makes us wealthy. The possessions we have makes us wealthy. But the, what makes us rich are the things that you can't touch, the things that you can't handle. And what Satan was offering to give to Jesus was things you could touch, money that you could handle, kingdoms that you could rule. And Jesus was very clear when he said, no, no, you worship God with your whole being. That's when you're rich. And, it, and we sit in a place like this because we want to be here. We sit in a place like this because we're comfortable here. We sit in a place like that because we're confident that the people on both sides of us are just as rich as we are. We don't have to have envy over what you have and what she has, for we all have the same thing. Satan tried to separate Jesus from God. He tried to convince him that there were things more important than the love of his Father. And Jesus said, no, there isn't. There's nothing, nothing more important, nothing that can make me richer than the love of my Father, the love of God. That's what the Scripture's about. It's not about kingdom. It's not about changing stones into bread. It's about understanding that the greatest gift we have, the riches that we have in our life, are not measured by our billfold, not measured by our, our bank account, but are measured by the love in our hearts for those around us and those around us who have love in their hearts for us. The great, great value of the love of God is that when we share it, it grows within us and makes us richer still. Oh, in the last one he said, throw yourself down and see if God will keep you from hitting the ground. Well, even I'm not going to fall for that one. I don't care how glib and how what a great talker Satan is. I mean, I can trip over a shoelace. I don't need to throw myself off of a high temper. And Jesus said, just don't tempt God. Don't try to make God be different in your life than he needs to be. Don't try to make God a different figure than he really is. Let him be real. Let him be real in your hearts. Let him be real in your life. Let him be real in your relationship with everyone around you. And I guarantee you that you will be richer tomorrow than you are today. Because his love will grow in you and you will reach out in his name and make miracles in other people's lives. I can't tell you what the miracles are going to be because I won't know where they are or when they are. But you'll make somebody's life different if you tell them, if you show them, if you lead them to the Christ that we know. Yeah, it's a great scripture. It's a great scripture. Jesus could, could resist the temptation of the devil. We have a, 
serious problem when we try to resist the temptations of the world. But the world will never make you rich. I don't care how much you get out of it. You only become rich in the gifts from God. Amen. Amen. The wonderful thing about being rich in the love of God is that you're never tempted to sell it. There's no amount of money that can make you different if you are in and around the love of God. So go in his peace, that peace that passes all understanding, the peace of being one with him who died that you might be free. Go in peace. Amen.